Okay, there are five basic types of reactions, and the fifth one really is a, as a subcategory. So the first one we're going to look at is double displacement. In a double displacement reaction, the substances involved exchange cations. So you have two uh, ionic substances here, lead nitrate, uh, plumbus nitrate that is, and potassium iodide. And the products are potassium nitrate and lead iodide. And one of the products is uh, actually precipitates lead iodide. So that's a double displacement. What happens is um, both cations exchange their anions. Mind you, potassium nitrate is soluble, so it doesn't form a precipitate. In a single displacement reaction, one element replaces another. And typically you can predict the outcome of these reactions if you know the activity series. Here we see that solid iron replaces copper in copper nitrate. So what happens is the, the iron becomes oxidized, it loses electrons, and then combines, it, has, it takes on nitrate as its counter ion, whereas copper takes away the electrons from iron and becomes precipitated. And you get uh, uh, copper precipitating onto either the, inside the beaker or onto the iron surface. If you, you, you can demonstrate this experiment by taking an iron nail and stirring it into a solution of copper sulfate or copper nitrate, and you'll see that the nail will become coated with copper. Uh, that's a single displacement reaction. When one substance breaks into two or more substances, it is a decomposition reaction. Uh, here we have a, a sample of sodium nitrate decomposing into sodium nitrite and oxygen gas. This would presumably take place with heating. Very often decomposition reactions take place when you heat some substance and it breaks into two or three or more, depending. Fourth example is when two substances combine into one, we call that a synthesis reaction. So the example I used here is aluminum metal combining with sulfur. Sulfur has eight atoms in its molecular form. Uh, so when we balance it, it's kind of tricky to balance, but the two different atoms combine to form aluminum sulfide. And you'll notice that the sulfide, which takes on a negative two charge, combines with the aluminum, which takes on a plus three charge, so you have to write the appropriate subscripts when they combine. And when we balance it, um, we start by looking at S8. We realize that we need eight sulfur atoms to appear on both sides, at least. But we, we notice that the S3 is um, the form that appears on the right side. Aluminum sulfide will have an S3 in it. So how do we get it balanced? Well, write a 3 in front of the S8 and write an 8 in front of the, S in front of the S3, you'll have 24 sulfur atoms. And then you can balance the, the 16 aluminum atoms that will result, because by writing 8 in front of Al2S3, you're, you're going to need 24 sulfurs and 16 aluminums to balance it on the other side. So here we have 24 sulfur atoms and 16 aluminum atoms. The fifth reaction is a combustion reaction. When a substance combines with oxygen, it is referred to as combustion, provided there is a fire or flame. But depending on the amount of oxygen, the combustion may be complete or incomplete. With complete combustion of a hydrocarbon, uh, you need oxygen, first of all, to support the combustion. But the only two products you will get are carbon dioxide and water. And the trick to balancing combustion reactions is to proceed alphabetically. First balance copper, uh, copper. first balance carbon, then balance hydrogen, and finally balance the oxygen. So what I did for the uh, for butane, it started with the unbalanced reaction to show you how it worked. I said, well, there are four carbon atoms in the, uh, from butane, so we're going to write a four in front of CO2, because the only thing that contains carbon uh, on the right side is carbon dioxide. But then we see that there are ten hydrogen atoms in butane, so we're going to put a five in front of water, because the only form of the only hydrogen that appears on the right side appears in the form of water. So we have our 10 hydrogens here, our four carbons there. Now we worry about balancing the oxygen. We see that there are four times two oxygens in carbon dioxide, giving us eight oxygens here, five oxygens here. So there are 13 oxygens appearing on the right-hand side. So we could write a 13 in front of O, but it's O2 so it's di because it's diatomic. So that's going to give us twice as many oxygen atoms as we want. So we're going to just write that over to take half of 13. 13 over 2 oxygens. Now, if writing fractions bothers you, even though it's perfectly legitimate, 
And if you don't like writing fractions, you can simply double everything, put a 2 in front of the butane, this becomes 13, that becomes 8, that becomes 10, and there is your balanced combustion equation with no fractions in it, all integer values. Both of these are correct. Now, what happens if the oxygen is scarce? If there's insufficient oxygen in a combustion reaction, we've all seen what happens. Uh, for example, in a badly tuned bus engine, you're going to see um, not only carbon dioxide and water coming out in the exhaust, but you're, all going to see, you're also going to see carbon monoxide, and in a particularly badly tuned engine, you might even see soot. You'll see the black smoke pouring out. And that's because not enough oxygen is combined with the fuel. And this is actually more appropriate to a real-world setting. Good afternoon, Crusaders. Please listen up.